Well, amen. I sure appreciate Brother Jeff and uh, his humble servant's attitude to help us all this time. Uh, last spring, Brother Don Stair uh, retired early, and uh, we were searching, and of course we pray an awful lot and talk to different people uh, about who will be the music and worship leader. And uh, through a lot of conversation, a lot of prayer in the last uh, eight or nine months, uh, Brother Jeff and I have come to the decision that God would have him to be our full-time music leader, and so we're making that official today, and uh, we're so glad for Brother Jeff coming on board, being a part of our staff, and um, I know that God is going to help us to uh, get the worship service uh, exactly the way that God would have us to, to have it so that we can all truly worship the Lord every Sunday morning, and we're very excited about that. And uh, so go in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah 43. I've got a lot to talk about today because God's given us a, a huge vision. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that God wants us to do. And uh, I know that we are the uh, same as every other church at this point. Uh, it looks a little uh, bleak. It looks a little difficult to get anything done this year because of everyone out with sickness and things that are going on. But let me tell you, God wouldn't give us a vision if he didn't think we could do it. And through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and God's power working through each and every one of us, I think that God's going to allow us to do even much more than what we're going to lay out today uh, in this coming year. And we're so glad that God does give us a vision. You know, the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. And let me tell you, you cannot go through this life and you can't keep going to church and over and over again trying to be the Christian that God wants you to be without a vision. You absolutely have to have a vision of what God wants you to do. Specifically, did you know that God has a vision for each and every single one of you today in this church and what God wants you to do to help us accomplish the global vision for our church? And so I'm excited to tell you what God's laid on my heart today. Isaiah chapter 43, I want you to begin uh, read, uh, watching as I read and listening as I read in verse number 9. Isaiah 43 Verse 9, the Bible says, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say, it is true. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. There was no God formed neither shall there be after me. Now, we're going to kind of comment as we move through the text, but I want you to see in verse 9 and 10 that God is saying, I want you, Israel, my nation, the children of God, I want you to be the witness of what? I want you to witness the fact that as we gather together and we assemble, uh, he's telling the nation of Israel, I want you to be witness to the fact that I, God says, I am God. He says, I want you to be a witness to that fact. And as a matter of fact, he said, if there's other gods, supposable gods, then why don't they come to the table, let's get them all up here on the platform, and they can tell me what happened before time. And if there's other gods really out there that exist, and they really are, they really are God, then let them predict the future. Not just a specific thing that we throw out there in a generality. No, no, no. God tells us exactly when something's going to happen. And he tells us the succession of what's about to happen. He tells us not only who's going to do what, but when they're going to do it and what's going to happen after that. No one else, even getting lucky, can prophesy like God can. And then he says, oh, by the way, I want you, children of Israel, to be a witness of the fact that before me, there were no gods created. No God formed himself before God. God is eternal. He's always been, and he always will be. And God says, oh, just by the way, since you weren't there, children of Israel, I want you to understand that nobody came before me. And there wasn't other gods that decided to get together and form me, God Jehovah. God is always and always has been and always will be the only one and true God. And he wants the children of Israel to be witnesses of that. 
And then he says in verse 11, I, God speaking still, even I am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Now, if you look back in the original language, that word Savior there doesn't just mean physical saving. God, yes, many, many times, he's going to talk about that in a minute. Many times he saved the children of Israel from Egypt, from bondage. He saved them in wartime. He saved them from their enemies. He saved them from starvation. He saved them from all kinds of physical things. But it's not just talking about the physical salvation or deliverance of the children of Israel. He's talking about he's the only one that can save them from their sins. He's the only one that can give them eternal life. He's the only Savior. There's no other Savior besides our God. Verse 12. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. God tells the children of Israel, go way back. Go way back to Father Abraham when the nation began. And y'all weren't out there, God says, going after idols and false gods. Remember way back at the beginning when I called Abraham out of the earth of Chaldees, God tells the children of Israel, back then there were no other strange gods, remember? Hmm. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Before the day was, I am, before the very first day of creation, God is. And I like what he says here. I like the way that God puts things sometimes. He says, I'm going to do, God says, I'm going to do something And who's going to stop me? That's what that verse means. God says, I'm going to do something amongst the children of Israel or in the world. God is going to, you know, there was no one to stop God when he extended the day and let the sun stay up for a whole day. Nobody said, oh, whoa, wait, I don't think you can do that, God. I think I'm going to keep you from doing that. No, no. When God decided to create the world and the universe in six days and rest on the seventh, nobody popped up and said, I don't think so, buddy. Why? Because he's God. And nobody can stop God. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Bethlehem, or to Babylon, I'm sorry, and have brought down all their nobles of the Chaldeans who cry, is in the ships. I'm the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Now watch what he's saying here. Don't miss this. He says, when Babylon came down, and Nebuchadnezzar, and the Persians, and all the things that have happened, he's basically writing, Isaiah's writing this, when they've been in captivity for a little while, and basically Babylon took over, and now Persia came in. Nobody ever thought Babylon could be conquered. Persia comes in uh, through a secret passageway, and through a secret, really amazing wartime thing, and they came in, and they captured Babylon, and now they're under the children of Israel, under captivity, under Persia, and God says, Who do you think did that? Who do you think got those generals and those captains and those military people? Who do you think lined up all the chariots for that to happen? God has his hand in every single military endeavor that has ever happened in the history of mankind. God sets up kingdoms and he tears down kingdoms. He sets up kings and he tears down kings. Let me tell you, he is God Almighty. And he's going through these things so that Israel will say, hey, we're witnesses of all that. We saw all that. We experienced all that. And God wants them to testify about it. Thus saith the Lord, verse 16, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse and the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as toe. Remember when he opened up and parted the Red Sea? And the children of Israel walked a million, two million strong, walked across on dry ground. But that wasn't enough. He had to do something about the enemy. And so as the Egyptian Pharaoh and all the Egyptian army tried to get into the middle of the Red Sea on dry land, as soon as the last Israelite crossed over onto the shore, God collapsed the water and they were all extinct. They were all extinguished. They were all killed in the middle of the Red Sea. Remember you not the former things? 
neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, wait a minute. Everything he's talked about up to now is pretty awesome. Wouldn't you agree? He was there before the world was ever founded. Nobody can stop our God. And when our enemies come after us, he's just going to drown them in the Red Sea. These are some pretty awesome things that he's talking about. And now he gets down in verse 19. He says, I'm going to do a new thing now. Now it shall spring forth, and ye shall not know it, and shall you not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And the beast of the field shall honor me, and the dragons and the owl, uh, the owls, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. What is he talking about? He's talking about in the future. When the millennial kingdom comes in and he reestablishes Israel and reestablishes Jerusalem, he's going to make water in the desert, in the wilderness. He's going to revive Jerusalem and the Israeli area. Did you know that that used to be like the Garden of Eden? All of Israel, where they're living right now, used to be like the Garden of Eden. God's going to send the water, and all the animals are going to sit off to the side and go, Wow, look at what God did for his chosen nation. Look at all this water. Look at all this greenery. Look at all the plants. This is amazing. Even the owls are going to get involved, I guess. They're going to say something. <laughs> now, verse 21 is our text, and I want, to, I want you to see this. This people, which people? The children of Israel, the nation of Israel. This people have I formed, God says, for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Do you know what Israel's job was to do? You know what God wanted them to do? You know what God created them to do? You know what their sole purpose in life was? To worship God Almighty. That's what he created them for. There was, there, yes, there's other things that we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just sit in here on the front pew and just worship God all day and all night. He's got uh, uh, things for us to witness. He's got people for us to talk to. But your soul and principal job as a Christian, just like the nation of Israel, he created you, dear Christian, to worship him. Matter of fact, not just the nation of Israel was created to worship and praise God, but all men everywhere were created for that purpose. Look at verse 7 of the same chapter, Isaiah 43. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Why did God create you? Why did God form you in the belly? Why did God lay out your life? Why did he lay out your future? Why are you here right now, this morning at Grace and Bible Baptist Church? It's to worship God. Matter of fact, we could go over to, well, let's go there. First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I just want you to see verse 9. As a matter of fact, not only did God create Israel for that purpose, not only did he create every man, uh, woman, boy, a girl, everyone that's ever lived on the face of the earth, he created them to worship him. But notice 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, talking about the church, talking about Christians in this time and in this day and age that we live in. But ye are, verse 9, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? Why did God create the church? Why did God make the church? Why did God give his uh, son to die for the church? Why are we here this morning? That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is why Grace and Bible Baptist Church exists. So that we can praise and worship our God. So, what's the problem? Uh, there, you know, if, if, if there wasn't a problem this morning, the Lord wouldn't have laid this message on my heart to, to give to you, to encourage you to fix the problem. And there is a problem. What's wrong with this scenario? Number one, I don't think the average Christian understands that their highest priority in their entire life is to worship God. That's part of the problem. But the main problem that we have this morning is do God's people really worship God? 
You see, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. If our main purpose in this life is to worship God, then are we doing it right? Are we effectively worshiping God? Well, the word worship, in the New Testament at least, is a putting together of two different words in the original language that mean worth-ship. And it gives you the idea of giving the worth to something that is worthy. Um, recognizing, I put a simple definition about worship here in my notes. Giving God the recognition he deserves. That is worship. Giving God the recognition that he deserves. Understanding that he is God and we are not. But here's where we get into, I think most everybody would, in a casual way, understand that definition we just gave you. And they would agree to it and probably say amen. But here's the problem. Real worship of God, as Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, you're going to worship God not in a place, come on, not in a location, not necessarily in a temple. He said their time is coming and it now is when God is looking, God the Father is looking for worshipers, true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So worship is an inward action, not an outward show. Man, preacher, that was good. I'm going to say that again. Worship is an inward action that happens in your heart and in your mind, and it's not an outward show. Now, what happens is, once I really truly worship God, and I recognize Him for who He is, and I give Him the worth and the praise that He is due, there's going to be some changes on the outside. I'm going to turn that frown upside down, to borrow a phrase. I'm probably going to get happy, and a lot of times the Bible references even that we're going to sing praises to God in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're going to love each other. There's all kinds of things that happen on the outside when we worship God, but it starts in here. Now listen to me very carefully. We cannot induce an outward reaction to make you worship. What am I saying? We can't all stand up right now and crank up the band and get the music loud enough where everybody starts dancing around and raising their hands and praising the Lord. We have not evoked true worship. All we've got is an outward show that you're doing all these activities and it appears that you're worshiping, but nobody knows what's going on in that person's heart. Matter of fact, there's a lot of church services going on right now where everybody's dancing around and waving their hands in the air and the music's really loud and the lights are strobing. And let me tell you, their heart is, has nothing to do with God at the moment. They might be going in their mind through, if it, it had to be a lady, men can't multitask like this. You know, if a guy is praising the Lord and dancing around and doing all that stuff, all he's got to do, the only thing he can think of is one, two, one, two, one, two. But a lady could be sitting there going through her list of groceries Monday that she's picking up. Uh, she could be going down through what she told the kids the other day. It doesn't mean, are you with me? It doesn't mean that she's worshiping God. Because it's an inward action, not an outward show. You say, well, where do you get that from, preacher? Well, look at Matthew chapter 15. You see, Jesus knows what's really going on inside of people. And I don't know, some, some people said, boy, I wish he was still on the earth and he was going around in his ministry today. I, I don't know that you do. <laughs> I'm not sure that you would want Jesus in a physical body to come in here and sit down and tell all of y'all what you're thinking in front of everybody else. It's what he did a lot. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 7, notice what he tells them and the crowd here. He says, ye hypocrites. Well, did Esaias, or Isaiah, prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, outward, 
show, and honoreth me with their lips, outward show, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, that means it's worthless, but in vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So apparently, you can be a really important religious figure. You can have all the outward show that anybody would ever want to show about worshiping God. And inside in your heart, you can be as far away from the Lord as possible. That's what Jesus just said. So guess what? Just because you're sitting there right now with your Bible open and you got a notepad and you're taking notes and you're paying attention and just because you say amen a bunch of times doesn't mean that you're really worshiping. Because it's an inward action, not an outward show. We can't really tell who's worshiping right now and, and who's not. But God can. You see, worship, now hang on a minute, worship is realizing inside your heart and mind how awesome God is. And that can happen through a song, it can happen through a scripture reading, it can happen through a testimony, it can happen from the Holy Spirit just putting it in your heart. I've truly worshipped the Lord all kinds of places and in all kinds of situations. Because there was just a thought or some type of, of leading of the Holy Spirit or a song or a scripture or something came to my mind. And I stopped for a minute and I got away from worrying about myself and I started thinking about how awesome God is and I worshipped him. Right in here, and right up here, and nobody else knew about it. So if we have that definition of worship, how many of God's people are truly worshiping God? Which is our first and foremost priority in life. That's what we were created for. The author of the book, Let the Nations Be Glad, said this. Worship is not a gathering. We call this service right now the worship service. But worship is not a gathering. It is not essentially a song service or sitting in under preaching even. Worship is not essentially any form of outward act. Worship is essentially an inner stirring of the heart to treasure God above all the treasures of the world. He goes, he goes on to say, a valuing of God above all else that is valuable. A loving of God above all else that is lovely. A savoring of God above all else that is sweet. An admiring of God above all else that is admirable. A fearing of God above all else that is fearful. A respecting of God above all else that is respectable. A prizing of God above all else that is precious. That, my friend, is worship. That is what you were created for. That is your sole purpose on this earth. And it will be your sole purpose in eternity. And I don't mean to be mean, but my how terrible we are at it. You can say amen right there. But you know what the saddest news, even more sad than that is? Even in not the most efficient way and not the best way, there's a lot of people in the world, hang on for it now, that don't worship God at all. There's a whole lot of people in the world that don't worship God at all. Now, most of you know me pretty well, especially from all the illustrations and all the preaching, if you've been here very long. And you know that I love coffee. Now, I couldn't find a good canister to do this with that is actually the coffee that I drink. I don't drink this, okay? I know a lot of you do. This is Folgers, okay? I'm not against Folgers. I just have other coffee brands that I like, but I just want to use this for an illustration today. Here's what most of the people in the world are doing today. They love 
coffee, let's say. And so what they've done is they went out and they found them a coffee canister. Just like this. And what they do is they, now don't miss this, they carry their God. And set him up. They do. They set him up on a table. Whether it be a statue, an image, uh, uh, something else. We're going to get into other idols and things in just a second. But they, they actually carry their God. You know the difference between an idol and our God? Is you carry the idol, God carries you. So they set him up over here on a table or on a pedestal. And they bow down and they worship the Folgers God. Oh, Folgers, we love you. We love how you make us feel in the morning. We'll give all our money and our time and attention to you, Folgers God. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's just a plastic jug of coffee grounds. What can Folgers can do for me? It doesn't talk, at least it better not, or you drank too much or did something too much the night before. It can't walk around. It can't answer any of your prayers. It can't help you at all. Matter of fact, look at Psalms 115. God kind of explains this to us. Psalms 115, verse 1. He says, now unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. Folger's God is not in the heavens. He's sitting on that table right there. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Remember, nobody can stop God. God does what he wants. Matter of fact, I can just come over here to Folgers God and put him on the ground if I want to. I can stop Folgers God anytime I want to. That was free. It wasn't even in the notes. I don't know where that came from. (laughs) Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Who made Folgers God, church? Man did. That canister, the plastic, was made in a factory. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Now hang on a minute. You ever wondered why? mythology and the gods that men have made are so horrible why are they so cruel why are they so jealous why do they got appeased by burning your kids in the fire why are they awful why are they cruel why are they nasty because men made them that's why and the men that made them are just like the gods because the men made the gods You know why our God's different? Number one, because he really is God. And number two, because we didn't make him. Now, it's not just people in remote villages all around the world or people in the Roman Catholic Church or other religions that bow down and worship an idol that's been created by man. I I couldn't do this Because it would ruin the platform and everything that Brother Mike and and Brother Pedro worked so hard to do for us last year. But um, we could bring us a car up here. We could bring us a new truck up here. And we'd see a lot of people, Christian and otherwise, that are bowing down to, oh, you GMC truck. Oh, we love you. We love how you make us feel in the morning. Now, we certainly couldn't do it if we, if we wanted to, but we could bring a house up here. And we would find a lot of people, Christian and otherwise, that are bowing down to the house 
We could bring people's bank accounts up here. We could bring people's jobs and their career up here. We could bring people's prosperity up here. We could bring people's privilege up here, their prestige, their power. We could go on and on and on, but there's a lot of people around the world that are worshiping something that is man-made. And they're giving all their time and all their attention and all their affection and all their love to that thing that can't respond. Now, I know if you call up on your bank account or you get on the computer, that maybe an Alexa-type voice is going to answer you and say, you have this much in your bank account. But try to have a conversation with that woman. It don't work. Your bank account can't walk around. It can't heal you from a disease. It can't, it can't communicate with you. It can't have a relationship with you because it's not God. Even though so many people would like to act like it is. So, you say, man, preacher, I thought we were doing Vision Sunday. We are. We're getting there. You see, right here, with all the peoples of the world, all so sadly, it's so discouraging, and it's heartbreaking that there would be all these people around the world, not only around the world, but in Sherman, Texas, that would be giving their whole life to worship the Folgers God. When God Almighty is right there wanting them to worship Him and to know all about Him and how awesome He is and how much He loves them and how much He cares for them and what He can do for them in their life. As a matter of fact, that's where missions comes in. You see, the truth of the matter is, is missions, our missions program and evangelism and trying to get the gospel out... It exists because true worship of the one true God doesn't. Did you get that? Missions in our church exist because all out in Sherman and all around the world, true worship of the true God does not exist. The same author said in the same book, Missions, now hang on before you throw stones at me. Listen to the whole statement. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over... And the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God. Missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity. But worship abides forever. So our goal and our vision for this year and all the years ahead of this one that God gives us is to become a real worshiper of God. Not outwardly, but inwardly. And then our goal as a result of that is to multiply the worshipers of the true God in Sherman and around the world. You say, well, preacher, if you put it like that, I can get involved in that, can I? Yes, you can. Every time you give out a track, you're trying to multiply the worshipers of God. As soon as somebody hears and reads a track and comes to our church and hears the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, they're going to be persuaded by the power of the Holy Spirit to become a worshiper of the true God. So... But what is missions? We use terms all the time, and I don't think sometimes people understand exactly what we're talking about. Psalms 96.3 says, Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. You know what what missions is? Is me coming down to somebody else that I live next to or somebody out in a foreign country, wherever they may be, and I talk to them for a little while and I say, Do you know Jesus? And they say yes or no. And I talk to them about how awesome my God is and what God has done for me in my life. 
And I get a little excited about it. Some of you may be very calm and very cool and collected. I get excited about it. And I tell them, hey, you need to meet. You need to have a relationship with my God because he's awesome. And then they, from the gospel and the preaching and the testimony and the witness that you just did, they either come to church or they do it right there in their home. And they accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Boom, another worshiper. We have multiplied the worshipers of God. Now there's one more that's going to worship God Almighty for all of eternity. And that's what we were created to do. So that, in a nutshell, is our purpose and our mission at Grace and Bible Baptist Church. To declare God's glory to everyone, everywhere, every chance we get. To turn people into true worshipers of the one true God. Multiply worship. Multiply the worshipers. Now we can't make somebody worship God any more than I can twist their arm to make them give me money. But God can. What did he tell Israel in the whole entire chapter that we just read and went through? You are the witnesses of these things. You're the one that saw my glory. You're the one that saw the parting of the Red Sea. You're the one that saw the Babylonian captivity come in and be changed over to Persia. You're the one that saw and experienced all these things. So go tell somebody about what God's done for you. And when you tell somebody and give them the gospel, chances are they're going to become a worshiper of God. And then we've multiplied the worshipers. So how does this work in the actual practical day-to-day stuff? God has put this in my heart in such a way that there is no turning back, number one, and there's no changing my mind or doing anything else. This is what God called us to do. And God has equipped us in an amazing way to do it. We have the beginnings of a missions team in our church, and we're actually going to have a missions team meeting tonight, if you'd like to be a part of it. The missions team is going to be in charge of helping all the missionaries and correspondence with the missionaries and getting the missions month ready and decorations and all kinds of things so that why? We can come into this building through the month of April and truly worship our God and then give our finances and our time and our talents so that other people can hear the gospel and become a worshiper of God. So we're forming a team to do that. We need some organization. We need a little bit of, of teamwork. And so we're developing the missions team. And I've got a, a gigantic program that we're going to go through in the next four or five years. Not only that, but God, through some donations and some things that have happened, we're finally going to be able to realize one of my dreams this year. Matter of fact, we've already done some preliminary work on it. And that is that we're going to convert the Welcome Center into a multiply worship coffee center. And at, from 8.30 to 9 o'clock every Sunday morning before we go to grow groups, we're going to have fellowship in there, and we're going to have coffee made by a real barista and other people that have been trained to do it that way. We'll have certain coffees that are available, the regular coffee for all of those of you that don't like that kind of coffee. But all the proceeds, proceeds through the company that we're working for, it's another guy that's a pastor of an independent fundamental Baptist church, He developed this company, and every single dime of the proceeds go to missions. And they've got all these different coffees, and it's really good coffee. And we're going to have the whole Welcome Center be a missions uh, center. And we're going to have a full display that you can go and see every missionary, where they're at, see their videos, see their social media posts, see everything that they have on a kiosk. We're going to put the whole thing in there as far as missions goes with mission statements. And we're going to take everything out of there and make it the, the Multiply Worship Center coffee place uh, for our church so that we can understand as soon as somebody walks in this building, they go, whoa, these people are about missions. And that's what I want. We're going to ask some of you to give of your time to make baked goods so that we can sell those in there. We'll have special days with coupons and all kinds of things to go on so that all of those proceeds go to missions. We gave $285,000 to missions last year. Praise God for that. But I sure would like to see that number half a million. 
You say, preacher, how are we going to get there? I don't know if we can squeeze any more blood out of this turnip. Well, we're going to develop a coffee center, that's how. And we're going to quit giving our money to Starbucks. Well, that wasn't in there either in the notes. <laughs> we're going to take missions trips. And we're going to gather up a bunch of people and we're going to prepare and we're going to train and we're going to go out to mission fields and we're going to help the missionary work. And from that, young people are going to get called into missions and they're going to become missionaries. And they're going to go through the Global Independent Baptist Missions Agency that's out of our church, that's here in town, that already has 52 missionary families that we're helping and we're supporting. They're all across the world preaching the gospel so we can multiply worshipers. I'm involved in a pastor's fellowship that's trying to plant 30 churches in the state of Texas by the year 2030. We've already went down to help one guy that was Brother Thaddeus in Garland. A bunch of people in the church loaded up and went down there and did one of his launch services for him. We're about to do the same thing in Rome, Texas for Heath Vanderbilt uh, that is out Vanderbilt that is out at Rome, Texas right now this morning having service and he's going to launch his official launch is in February and we're going to go out there and pass out John and Romans. We're going to go out there and be a part of his launch service. You're going to be a part of that. Why? Because we want mer- worshipers of the true God in Rome, Texas. That's why. We want to do everything we can to reach more people in Gracie County. We can't forget the home front. We can't just give all our money and say, oh, missionaries, go. You guys go. No, no, no. We got to go. And there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing this year that we've never done before to try to get more visitors and try to get more visitors to stay and try to get more visitors to be saved and join the church so that we can multiply worshipers for the cause of Jesus Christ. In 2020, we helped you and we taught you how to connect to Jesus Christ and other people. In 2021, we tried to help you to grow in the Word of God. And this year, we're going to try to help you to serve by loving God and others. There's going to be all kinds of opportunities for you to serve in the church. Now look back in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And look at verse 10 again. God says to the children of Israel and to us, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Did you know there's no other way to become a worshiper of God, of the true God, but salvation? The gospel is the only way to become a worshiper of God. Not only that, it's the only way to get to heaven. The Bible's very clear in Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. The only way you're going to get to heaven and become a worshiper of the true God is through the gospel plan of salvation, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the God-man that gave his life in your place to pay the price and the wrath of God for your sins. And when you come to that Savior, Jesus Christ, in full faith and trust in what he's done on the cross of Calvary for you, when you come and repent of those sins and ask him to come into your heart and save you of those sins, He gives you eternal life, and he turns you into a worshiper of the true God. And that is what we are all about at Grace and Bible Baptist Church. We're going to be more focused. We're going to be more in tune. We're going to be going at it. We're going to be planning. We're going to be strategizing more than we ever have been before. Because our job, what we were created for, is to worship the true God and help multiply the worshipers. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And God, I just pray that you would help us to understand the concept and the the content, the message that you've given us today. Lord, we get so distracted as your children. Trying to do every other thing in our life. 
but do what you were created us to do, and that is to worship you. Not in an outward show and not in some kind of formality or some kind of religious experience that we think we're supposed to do, but, Lord, inside our heart, we can worship you every day, all day. Lord, would you help us to understand that we were created and our principal purpose is to worship you inwardly. And then, Lord, as a church, you have called us to help in the great endeavor of multiplying your worshipers around the world. Would you help us with that? Would you speak to our hearts today? Give us the vision that you want us to have. Help us to understand how we fit into the vision and what we can do to advance it. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.